welcome to this latest edition of Questions About Anne Boleyn. And this is um, today handling a question that I often get asked and a kind of presumption that I, I see a lot on social media. The idea that Anne Boleyn and her cousin Catherine Howard were just pawns of their families and that their families were completely to blame for what happened to them. Now, Anne Boleyn and her cousin Catherine Howard both started out as maids of honour at King Henry VIII's court. Anne Boleyn serving Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and Catherine Howard serving his fourth wife, Anne of Cleves. Both of these girls caught the king's eye and went on to become his wife. And both were sadly executed as traitors. Absolutely awful ends to them. In recent years, both of these women have been successfully rehabilitated. The majority of people believe that Anne Boleyn was innocent of the charges laid against her in 1556, which included committing adultery with four men, committing incest with her brother, and plotting with all five men to kill the king. And people are also questioning Catherine Howard's downfall, with some seeing her as a foolish girl out of her depth, others seeing her as sexually abused, and still others seeing her as a victim of warring factions at court. It's wonderful that we are reassessing these women and their stories, but something that always seems to happen when we rehabilitate one character is that someone else is maligned. In this case, their families are seen as the baddies. It goes to show just how powerful fiction and TV can be, TV like the Tudor series, with many people taking it as a fact that Anne Boleyn's family sacrificed their daughters, Mary and Anne, to climb the ladder of success at court. Thomas and Elizabeth Boleyn are depicted in shows like The Tudors and In the Other Bling Girl um, and things like that as plotting with Elizabeth's brother, Thomas Howard, third Duke of Norfolk, to get influence and favour by pushing the girls into Henry VIII's way. Mary Boleyn being the king's mistress is good for the family, but the potential of Anne being his queen is even better. And the Boleyns and Howards don't seem to care who gets in their way or how the girls feel about it all. Anne is forced into manipulating the king into marriage, holding out on him and reeling him in until he commits to marrying her. The family rub their hands with glee as rewards such as lands, offices and titles come their way. And then they run in the opposite direction when Anne is brought down and executed. These calculating people retreat for a while lick their wounds and then are back at court as if nothing happened. And the Duke of Norfolk is willing to play the game all over again because it's never his daughter he's sacrificing, it's just his nieces. But as I've pointed out in previous videos on Thomas Boleyn, Thomas really had no need to act as a pimp, uh, to pimp out his daughters to the king. He'd started his royal career in King Henry VII's reign and was already an esquire of the body before King Henry VIII came to the throne and he was a favoured courtier. He simply carried on in the same vein in Henry VIII's reign, being granted a whole host of lands and offices before either of his girls went anywhere near the royal court. And he was a trusted and gifted diplomat, carrying out missions for the king and being rewarded for his service. By 1519, when Mary Boleyn might have replaced the pregnant Bessie Blunt as the king's mistress, Thomas Boleyn was already an important ambassador and privy councillor. Thomas deserved his rise at court. He was a key courtier, a trusted advisor, and a skilled negotiator and diplomat. We don't know the Boleyn's feelings about Mary's sexual relationship with the king, although the fact that the king had to step in and ask Thomas Boleyn to provide for his daughter Mary after she was widowed suggests that the Boleyns had distanced themselves from Mary at some point. But we do get an insight into Thomas's feelings about Anne's relationship with the king. 
The imperial ambassador, Eustace Chapuis, noted, I must add that the said Earl of Wiltshire has never declared himself up to this moment. On the contrary, he has hitherto, as the Duke of Norfolk has frequently told me, tried to dissuade the king rather than otherwise from the marriage. And the Duke of Norfolk didn't seem to be pushing Anne at the king either, with Chapuis writing, shortly after the Duke began to excuse himself and say that he'd not been either the originator or promoter of this second marriage, but on the contrary, had always been opposed to it and tried to dissuade the king therefrom. Had it not been for him and for the father of the lady who feigned to be attacked by frenzy to have the better means of opposing it, the marriage would have been secretly contracted a year ago. And for this opposition, the Duke observed, the lady had been exceedingly indignant with the one and the other. As for what happened in 1536, we don't have any details on the Boleyn's feelings about the falls and executions of their son and daughter. Thomas was appointed to the commission which sat in judgment on four of the men and which found them guilty, which must have been awful for him as there was no way of Anne being found innocent after that. And the Duke of Norfolk presided over the trials of George and Anne, weeping as he pronounced sentence. It's easy for us to judge Thomas Boleyn for coming back to court and serving King Henry VIII after his children's deaths and for attending Edward VI's christening. But what choice did he have? It was his job, and like others before him, including the Howards and Staffords, he had to prove his loyalty and serve the king faithfully for the sake of his remaining family. The king was his master, his boss, the person who kept Thomas and his family fed and watered. Thomas was a royal servant. That was his occupation. I'm sure Thomas and Elizabeth spent many hours weeping at Hever Castle in the days following Anne and George's executions, but they knew the drill. And at least Thomas had the opportunity at Edward VI's christening to see his granddaughter, Elizabeth. Here in the 21st century, we can judge Thomas and think that he should have just told the king where to go. But we have choices today. Thomas really didn't. Elizabeth and Thomas Boleyn didn't live to see the downfall of their niece, Catherine Howard, thank goodness, as they died in April 1538 and March 1539, respectively. In the late 1539, Catherine Howard was appointed to serve Anne of Cleves, who was going to become King Henry VIII's fourth wife. She married him on the 6th of January 1540, Anne, that is. Catherine was young and pretty, but she had rather a questionable past, having been involved with two men, her music teacher Henry Mannox and Francis Derham, a member of her step-grandmother, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk's household. Catherine's relationship with Mannox went as far as gift-giving, the exchange of letters and some heavy pessing. But her relationship with Derham was a full sexual one and they also called each other husband and wife. They could even be said to have been married because according to church law, all that was needed for a valid marriage was a promise and consummation. No witnesses or paperwork were required. So Catherine Howard wasn't a virgin and may even have been married when she caught the king's eye. She'd also been romantically involved with Thomas Culpepper, a groom of the king's privy chamber when she first arrived at court but he broke things off. Now, we don't know exactly when the king's eye fell on Catherine, and he certainly wasn't taken to a brothel to find her. She went to court ready to serve his fourth wife in late 1539. The Duke of Norfolk did not push his niece at the king to tempt him away from Anne of Cleves in some kind of plot to bring Thomas Cromwell down. Gareth Russell, in his book on Catherine, Young and Damned and Fair, which I would highly recommend, notes that the king's attraction to Catherine was obviously very useful to Gardner and the Duke, who were Catholic conservatives and growing enemies of Thomas Cromwell, but that there's no evidence to paint these men as pimps pushing Catherine at the king in the hope that they could tempt him away from Anne. 
the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk remembered the king being smitten by Catherine at first sight. So, as Gareth Russell states, the initial stage of their relationship was spontaneous and apparently inconsequential. In Russell's view, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, the king was attracted to Catherine when she arrived at court and it was a flirtation. But when he didn't like Anne of Cleves, his interest in her maid of honour was revived and Catherine became an alternative to Anne in the king's eyes. I expect the Dowager Duchess panicked somewhat when it was clear that the king wanted to marry Catherine, knowing what she did about her and her past. I think if Norfolk had known about Catherine's past, then he may well have done something about the situation, nipping it in the bud and perhaps making it clear that Catherine wasn't suitable. As Gareth Russell points out, if the Howards had wanted to entice Henry VIII, they would not have chosen Catherine. She was damaged goods. Her past dalliances were just too much of a risk. I expect the Howards didn't even realise just how keen the king was on Catherine until it was all too late. And then they just made the best of the situation. In June 1540, Anne of Cleves realised that her husband was rather taken by her maid of honour and it was rumoured that the king would set her aside to marry Catherine, which he shortly did. His marriage to Anne was annulled on the 9th of July 1540 and he married Catherine Howard on the 28th of July 1540. Unfortunately, one of Catherine's former dormitory mates from her time with the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk told her brother of Catherine's former relationships and the brother told the king's privy council. As Catherine's past was investigated, it came to light that she'd been having secret meetings with Thomas Culpepper. While they may not have actually consummated their union, her behaviour with him and the fact that she'd employed her former lover, Derham, suggested to the Crown that she was intending to commit adultery. Catherine was attainted and executed, along with one of her ladies, Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, and several members of the Howard family were imprisoned for covering up Catherine's deeds. The Boleyns and Howards certainly had a role in bringing these girls to court. Gentry and noble families sought positions at court for their children. Serving the monarch or the monarch's consort was a wonderful opportunity for a young man or woman. It could lead to favour and rewards for the families and also good marriages as their children mixed with the children of other nobles at court. It also helped train them to run their own households in years to come, and they might end up serving at court for the rest of their lives and being promoted to positions close to the monarch. It's no wonder that Lady Lal, for example, sent gifts to King Henry VIII in the hope that he'd offer one of her daughters a position of maid of honour. Serving the king was a duty and an honour, something which every family wanted for their children. So the Boleyns and Howards wanted their children to go to court, to serve as maids of honour and grooms, to work their way up and have a successful court career. They were no different to any other family of their standing, and they certainly didn't do anything different to give their children a leg up, unless you count Thomas Boleyn giving Anne a wonderful education and securing her a place at Margaret of Austria's court. The Boleyns and Howards could not have known that Anne could ever end up marrying the king. There just wasn't a precedent for a maid of honour winning the heart of the king and becoming his wife. Elizabeth Blunt had been a maid and had been his mistress and then had a good marriage arranged for her. That was the best you could hope for if King Henry VIII fancied your daughter and it seems to have been what happened to Mary Boleyn. But Henry wanted to possess Anne completely, and her family could not have known that. As for Catherine Howard, yes, her cousin had risen from maid to queen, and Jane Seymour had too. But Catherine was just one of a number of ladies at court. Were Anne Boleyn, Mary Boleyn, and Catherine Howard pawns? Well, yes in the way that daughters in those times were only important for the marriage match that they could bring their family. 
That's what they were raised for, to land a good man and to be a good wife. But did these girls' families manipulate them into attracting the king and playing him? No. That makes a great novel, but there's no historical evidence to support that idea. While we rehabilitate Anne Boleyn, Mary Boleyn and Catherine Howard, can't we spare a thought for their families and rehabilitate them too? Surely, if we're going to blame anyone for Anne and Catherine's demise, perhaps we could blame King Henry VIII. I'd love to know your thoughts. What do you think of all this? Do you think the Boleyns and Howard should take responsibility? Are they to blame? Or should we actually lay the blame at King Henry VIII's feet? So please do comment below and say what you think. Thank you for joining me. You can subscribe to this channel by clicking round about there. Do have a good browse of this channel. There's all sorts of Tudor history goodies. And you can, of course, give me a like if you've enjoyed this video today. I'll see you very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.